Greta Gerwig's Barbie stands out among most modern blockbusters. From its opening frames, it feels different. The reason why lies in the unique approach Gerwig and a team took to the film's production design. What makes Barbie's production design so special? How did the Barbie crew achieve the visual feast that is the final product? I'm actually not sure. This is how they shot it. Barbie. Before we get started, subscribe to Studio Binder and enable notifications to stay up to date for all our filmmaking videos. We'll be building a shot list in Studio Binder to track how Gerwig and her team brought Barbie to life. Let's begin. Let's do this. Can I sit in the front? No. To understand what makes Barbie's production design so mind-boggling, it is important to first understand what exactly a production designer does. The PD is the head of the art department. They work closely with the director and cinematographer to create the aesthetic of a film. The production designer of Barbie, Sarah Greenwood, describes her role as such. Production designer is responsible for the visual part of the storytelling of a film. And then you look like me. Ah! Oh! Sorry. I understand. I set myself up for that. This means overseeing the creation and decoration of sets, helping with the selection of props, and collaborating with the costume and makeup departments to ensure the overall look is cohesive. Production designers will often work very closely with a set decorator, and this is especially true for Greenwood, who has worked with set decorator Katie Spencer on a multitude of films. The set decorator will fill out the set with items that are specific to a given movie's world. Katie Spencer explains. A set decorator varies from a production designer, in fact, that they don't draw or build the sets, but once they're drawn and built, they would furnish the sets, they would populate the sets. I always say, like, if I was in somebody's house, it's everything that can move. According to Greenwood, Gerwig approached the duo because she admired their ability to create complete worlds, like the ones in Anna Karenina or Beauty and the Beast. Through both production design and cinematography, a complete world was certainly built for Barbie. To create it, the team first needed to do extensive research for inspiration. When discussing her goal for the overall aesthetic of Barbie, Greta Gerwig returned to one phrase over and over again, authentic artificiality. In other words, she wanted Barbie Land to feel theatrical and heightened, while also feeling tactile and real. Greenwood explains. Everything that is in front of camera has to be real, so that you as a viewer will watch it and go, that's there, that's built. That is this kind of authentic artificiality. As such, the team embraced the look of massive, colorful sets built on sound stages. This meant finding inspiration in the musicals of Hollywood's golden age. Gerwig notes the importance of The Wizard of Oz, for example. It does something that I wanted to emulate, which is these incredible sound stages and these painted skies, which I think is very beautiful and emotional. Color, too, is crucial to Barbie's aesthetic. And for the palette, Gerwig found inspiration in the work of Jacques Demy, the French New Wave director known for his colorful musicals like Umbrellas of Cherbourg and Young Girls of Rochefort. Gerwig and her team also looked at the paintings of Wayne Thiebaud to echo his use of color. As Gerwig notes, the painter uses no black and no white in his shadows. That was very much something that we did in our Barbie land. We used no black, no white, no chrome. Another breakthrough came from the work of photographer Slim Arons, whose pictures evoke the feeling the Barbie team wanted to create. As Spencer explains, his pictures are of women with women, and there's no sense of threat. Women being comfortable with each other, just being innocent. The actual architecture of Barbie Land also required extensive research. 
neither Greenwood nor Spencer were very familiar with the Barbie doll aesthetic. So they bought a Barbie dream house to analyze what they could pull from it. But they knew that they didn't want to directly copy the toy. As Greenwood explains, we're not recreating Mattel. We are interpreting the dream houses through the last 70 years. Greenwood and Spencer also heavily borrowed from the architecture and look of Palm Springs, leaning into mid-century California design. The dream house in particular references Richard Neutra's Kaufman House, and its pool is reminiscent of the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotels. Weird Barbie's house, meanwhile, was inspired by Boo Radley's house in To Kill a Mockingbird, as well as the iconic house from Psycho. Once the research in pre-production was complete, the art department then moved to the next step, building the sets. The massive Barbie Land set was constructed at Warner Brothers Studios outside of London. Sarah Greenwood and Katie Spencer spent five months in pre-production and production lasted nearly another five months. One of the most important decisions when constructing the world was the shade of pink. Pink, I think, is the first thing that comes to mind when you think of Barbie. And so the most important color for us to get right was the pink. Our pink had to be a very, very pure Barbie pink. And to find that, it was a case of actually creating it from scratch. The two went through hundreds of pinks before settling on the perfect shade a mix of Roscoe fluorescent pink with white paint. Because they needed to coat nearly the entire set in the color, they ordered 200 liters to their set, a process complicated by a worldwide shortage of pink. I think we will all want to do a black and white movie next. <laughs> the two recount that the Warner Brothers executives were phoning Roscoe's executives. Everybody tried to find pink paint, and we were thankfully sorted we managed to find it. The background of Barbie Land, too, needed to be painted. The blue sky and mountains were hand-painted onto an 800-foot-long, 50-foot-high backdrop. When constructing the Barbie houses, Greenwood and Spencer decided that everything should be shrunk by 23%, emulating the feeling of a doll house, where the doll is slightly too large for its home and furniture. One practical complication for the houses was the lack of walls. Greenwood explains, In the script, Greta describes houses with no walls. Houses with no walls wouldn't stand up. So we ended up with that chimney breast that runs through the middle. The chimney with all this pink stonework that's painted. No walls also meant Greenwood and Spencer needed to think about the 360 degree view far off in the distance. As Spencer notes, your perimeter is very different from what it would normally be. Your wallpaper is not just behind you, it's all the three-dimensional things that are behind that, which are the trees, the mountains of houses, other actors, so that was quite tricky. For certain shots where the size of the world went beyond the scope of the set, Greenwood and Spencer constructed miniatures at 1 to 18 scale. This was one of the few times VFX were employed, as these miniatures were composited into the shot in post. I'll see you on the Malibu beach! Sure. For the beach, the two leaned into authentic artificiality, as Greenwood explains. Doing the sea as these beautiful carved waves, they were about 100 foot long, they went up to like six, seven foot high, and the sand, of course, in Barbie Land is this beautiful pale pink. And then you have the water comes in and goes back out, so you have the foam. Greenwood and Spencer had to rethink the look of Barbie Land once the Kens take over. To indicate the shift, they decided with Gerwig to introduce blacks and whites to make the world much less visually appealing. To heighten the dissonance, Greenwood and Spencer introduced real-world items into the Ken Dom, from mini fridges and leather couches to Hummers and TV screens. This shall henceforth be known as Ken's Mojo Dojo Casa House. You don't have to say dojo and house and casa. But you do because it feels good. 
Try it. Mojo Dojo. Once the laborious task of building the world was complete, it was time to capture the sets. Here we go, Barbie day one. Making the sets was only half the battle. They also needed to translate onto the camera. This is where director of photography Rodrigo Prieto came in, navigating the fine line between emphasizing the bright colors and not crowding the frame. Gerwig describes her discussions with Prieto. Talking about the sort of layering the colors and almost how you'd shoot five different shades of pink or red in one shot and not have it overwhelm anything. You feel like there's separation, but that it's vibrant. For Prieto, utilizing the colorful sets meant making sure they were brightly and evenly lit. Greenwood recalls the DP's approach. Rodrigo Prieto's lighting was so pure, like a thousand sky pans in the roof and big, soft suns. The wattage was fantastic. Normally, when you go on a film set, it's all focused into this little dark corner and everything else is black. It was the opposite with us. Everything was colorful from wall to wall. Prieto also augmented the authentic artificiality of the set by lighting every angle as though the sun was behind the character. The cinematographer rigged multiple soft suns on lifts so that he could simply turn different ones on and off depending on which way the camera was facing. He explains, when you pan the camera around, now it's backlit again. So we took away one sun and brought up another. So it's artificial but I did want it to feel almost like you're in an actual exterior in terms of the lighting. One of the challenges that came with such a saturated set was the bounce light. Because so much of the world was pink, the backlight would bounce back on the actors' faces and make them look magenta. Prieto didn't want to use a negative fill to eliminate the bounce because it would create harsh shadows that went against the film's aesthetic. So instead, he draped anything that wasn't on camera in grey, creating a neutral fill that maintained the high-key lighting. As a final touch for the colourful world, Prieto decided on a LUT in post that was based on three-strip Technicolor, the hyper-saturated medium many of Gerwig's inspirations were shot on. Depth of field also played into the artificiality of the world, Prieta shot on an Alexa 65, which has a large sensor that results in a shallower depth of field. For the cinematographer, this made Barbie Land feel slightly more like a miniature. For the real world, Prieto altered his approach to emphasize the difference in setting. He used a smaller sensor and a less colorful LUT to make the footage feel more grounded. He also would use longer lenses which he avoided in Barbie Land. Closer I am to With Barbie, Greta Gerwig and her crew created a unique and breathtaking world unlike anything audiences have seen before. Gerwig, Greenwood and Spencer utilized visual palettes and practical techniques from Hollywood's golden age reaching backwards in order to push the medium forward. As Gerwig and her team illustrated, creating a movie like Barbie requires a lot of planning. Start working on your own project with Studio Binder's mood board and storyboard software. Check out our mood board based on Barbie's influences linked in the description. Good luck and remember, you're Kenaf. Thank you. Thank you, Barbie. Thank you.